Good morning. My, I'm Jennifer Stransko, the Physician Engagement Associate of Maven Project, and I welcome you to today's session on Hiring for Success, a session from the partnership with Maven Project and Direct Relief. It is a pleasure for Maven Project to partner with Direct Relief. Here is a little more about our organizations. Maven Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. Our experienced volunteer physicians offer provider-to-provider -provider medical consults, one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and customized education sessions. Direct Relief is a nonprofit humanitarian medical assistance organization founded in 1948. Direct Relief supports the needs of healthcare providers and their patients worldwide. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Edward Hatler, um, MD, retired from the Permanent Medical Group after 30 years working as a general internist. He had a large practice of Medicare patients, diabetics, and patients with heart failure, cardiovascular disease, and other general medical problems. Dr. Hatler is also an athlete who is interested in patients with musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal problems and sports-related injuries. For 23 years, he served as Chief of Medicine at Kaiser Milpitas working on innovations and efficiencies to deliver healthcare more e effectively and efficiently. Dr. Hatler brought motivational interviewing training to Kaiser's chronic conditions team, helped start their embedded psychologist program, including efforts to reduce, reduce opioid use in their clinic. And so whenever you're ready, Dr. Hatler, I feel free to share your slides and begin. Okay, uh, well, thank you, Jennifer, and welcome to everybody. Um, today, I'm going to share my experience and journey as uh, Chief of Medicine at Kaiser Milpitas. Um, and Milpitas is, for people who don't know, it's a very diverse community in Silicon Valley, just north of San Jose and about an hour from San Francisco and Oakland. Most of the talk will cover the behavioral-based interviewing technique and questions we use to find candidates who were the best fit for our department. But before I get into that part of the talk, I'm going to give you some background to the challenges we faced and what we looked for in new hires. Um, within a couple of years of becoming chief, uh, which was in the mid-1990s, our organization was very close to going out of business. Our model was a low cost model that didn't provide great service and other competitors were matching our low costs with better service. Our leadership moved to a value-based model, which entailed making many changes. Our doctors were asked to work 10% more shifts to make uh, with the same compensation. It was a hard time. I was a middle manager wanting to see the group succeed and balancing the needs of my colleagues and my superiors. My colleagues were generally feeling overwhelmed and my superiors were generally looking for better quality, improved service score and better access for our patients. Early in my tenure as chief, we lost two doctors in part because they struggled to meet the organization standard for patient satisfaction survey scores. They were both good doctors. They evaluated patients well and made accurate diagnosis. Turnover in our department was stressful. Patients were shifted from panels of the doctors leaving to the remaining docs. And our access goals were much harder to achieve. Um, so that was a tough time. And um, uh, I'm gonna shift gears for a second and uh, share this joke with you before we get into the meat of the talk. Um, uh, I was in a job interview today when the manager handed me his laptop and told me, I want you to try and sell this to me. So I put it under my arm and walked out of the building and went home. Eventually he called my mobile and said, bring it back here right now. I said $200 in the chairs. And then uh, just to share some hiring quotes, 
the secret of my success is that we have gone to exceptional lengths to hire the best people in the world. Um, sorry, that's skipping. Uh, the cost of hiring someone bad is so much greater than missing someone good. And people are not your greatest asset, the right people are. So, um, uh, I would say, you know, I faced a lot of challenges and, uh, uh my guess is that, uh, federally qualified health clinics, uh, face challenges that are ex exponentially harder. Um, I made a partial list of some of the problems that you face, um, challenging populations, low reimbursement locations of clinic, turnover of support staff, um, primary care, losing respect nationally. Uh, I would say you guys are far more well-versed in the problems of the patients served by F FHQCs, victims of trauma, people raised with adverse childhood events, mental health and substance abuse, homelessness, challenges of trying to make ends meet and educational levels. Um, um, for us, um, uh, we looked for um, uh, primary care. We thought of primary care as a long-term commitment. So fit in our group was very important. Um, we saw excellent relationships as the backbone of success uh, and that would drive performance uh, performance and quality metrics. And our organization had a value-based philosophy. So we wanted people who were comfortable practicing cost-effective medicine. Um, we saw doctors who were intelligent, curious, passionate about the practice of medicine. Um, and actually at the time that that I took over, there was some debate within our organization about what primary care should look like. We had the classic view of the primary care physician developing strong bonds with their patients, helping them solve problems, manage chronic conditions, and guiding them through our healthcare system. Um, and as we remodeled primary care, our, our vision, which was initially in the minority, quickly won over the rest of the group. Um, so, uh, also in terms of hiring characteristics, um, we had a very diverse, um, population, many patients who spoke English as their second language. Um, we had, um, ethnicities, Hispanic, Vietnamese, Chinese, Indian, and Filipino. And we tried to match the diversity of our po patient population with our uh, physician population um, to have physicians who spoke the native language of our patients, um, which we hope would make people more comfortable uh, with uh, doctors who spoke their language and knew their culture. Um, we also sought and, and relatively even distribution of male and female physicians. And uh, lastly, I'll say practicing in a large group setting means that you will need to accept compromises to some extent. There will be policies and procedures established by the group that will affect how you practice. As part of the group, you will have some input in how things are run, but ultimately, it will not always be run exactly the way you want. Um, our our value-based model entailed making many changes, switching to a panel system, working to improve access, service, and quality for our, our patients. Uh, we started to grow and needed to continue to hire. We had two outstanding pipelines, one from Santa Clara Valley Residency Program and a second from our Kaiser Santa Clara Residency Program. Uh, we had a very strong connection with the people, the leaders at Santa Clara Valley, and they 
gave us the inside scoop on physicians and uh, funneled some of their best doctors to us. Um, for you um, in the FHQC community, I would suggest that you might be able to find a pipeline of uh, retired doctors to recruit, doctors who might be able to um, help you with coverage work. I, I know that our Northern California Kaiser system uh, has recently begun to allow retired docs to do work uh, as virtualists and they can work up to 20% of the time. Also from my um, retired doctors hiking group, I know that there's uh, at least some doctors who are working in primary care clinics and they are willing to accept lower reimbursement um, because they, they have kind of relatively comfortable retirements. Um, and I would say that retired doctors, um, a benefit is that they have a wealth of experience, um, but also consider that they're looking for a slower pace and flexibility and time off and scheduling. Um, now I'm going to move into our hiring process for career physicians. Um, so let's talk about screening. Um, inviting a candidate to interview was time consuming. We tried to screen out physicians that were less likely to join. Our recruiter sent us people that we might have, have deemed not to be connected to the area uh, or not to have resumes that we were looking for. Um, so we kind of tried to screen out um, those types of people. Uh, I know that screening applicants is a subjective bias and um, just want to say that we, we tend to prefer people that are more like ourselves and that can be a limitation. For me, I'm an exercise fanatic, a lover of the outdoors, and I often um, rationalize this preference by telling myself that people who exercise more would handle the stresses of their job to a greater extent. Um, nevertheless, I would say it's a risk um, and that you may be able to mitigate that risk of missing some good people um, by, uh, by using more than one screener um, to reduce your biases. Um, and now I'm gonna get into the meat of this talk um, and talk really about uh, behavioral-based interviewing. Um, and that is used to question a candidate about their past experience. Its premise is that past experience is an excellent predictor of future behavior. Behavioral interviewing questions are used by a wide range of employers. They seek to learn how the applicant would respond to specific workplace situations and how they would solve problems. The interviewer should probe and ask follow-up questions to clarify the answers. These questions are challenging and they gave us a better understanding of the candidate. We use the same format for interviewing candidates for over 20 years. By using the same interview questions, it's much easier to compare how people respond. Beyond the leadership interview, candidates would meet with a mixture of new and more seasoned doctors and then go out to lunch. We selected our best doctors, our happiest doctors to meet with the candidates. These other doctors gave the candidate an opportunity to explore life in our clinic and outside of our clinic. It also gave docs a role in selecting their colleagues. Um, today, I'm going to review uh, a bunch of the questions we use in our behavioral-based interview. So the first question we use um, was why are you interested in working at the Permanente Medical Group and specifically in at Milpitas? 
And have you interviewed at other uh, permanent medical group facilities? These questions give us an idea about the applicant, what the applicant has learned about our group, if they have spoken with friends or colleagues who work with us. Um, I, I got some feedback and many in the audience have said that they are looking for mission-driven people. And I think this question will help uh, you start to distinguish people by how much they talk about the mission uh, when they interview with you. Um, describe how you deal with cost effectiveness. What specific things do you do personally to provide cost effective care? Our organization had a, a strong focus on cost effectiveness. Um, this question uh, is designed to learn how a candidate would fit into that culture. Um, in behavioral based interviewing, we ask the ap applicant to give us an example of, um, of how they dealt with cost effectiveness. And sometimes in follow-up, we would ask a second question about how an applicant might deal with a patient that's demanding an MRI when we felt that the MRI was of low or no value, which was a common situation in that our physicians faced. Uh, next question was, um, how do you deal with the uh, hectic day in clinic. You might have numerous phone calls and emails to return, urgent labs or test results, and you're overbooked with patients. How do you organize your priorities and cope with the situation? There's a wide variation in these time management and coping skills, and they have a significant impact on the health and well-being of physicians. Um, can you describe your philosophy about the practice of medicine? This question is very open-ended and resulted in a wide variety of answers. I was looking to see how dedicated the applicant would be to our mission with this question and see if they were giving, if they were service-oriented, which were big factors in having success in our group. What types of patients are difficult for you? How do you react when you meet such a patient? How do you deal with them? I believe that a good physician will set clear boundaries with their patients. The most common difficult patients were the drug seeking patient. We would ask the applicant to tell us about one of these patients that they encountered and how they dealt with them. Um, the next question, our department is divided into modules. How would you deal with a doctor who's not fully contributing to the team's workload? Here, we're uh, getting into how a person deals with conflict, whether or not they are confrontational, and do they consider what stresses the colleague might be under? Some applicants would have experience with this type of situation when they're leading a team in residency, and they were able would be able to tell us how they dealt with this situation. Uh, others would just uh, theoretically tell us how they dealt with this and not have uh, not have a lot of experience with it. Our department is very service oriented. Can you give us an example when you provided outstanding service for a patient when you went over the top for a patient? Service and personal connections are the core of practicing primary care and a requirement for becoming partner and being successful in our group. Some people naturally have outstanding interpersonal skills. Most people can learn these skills. Our group required doctors to demonstrate competence and service before they could become a partner. And we, we had extensive tra service training for all physicians. What would you say are some of your strengths and your limitations or what could be improved? 
strengths and weaknesses are very typical interview question. It, it also gave me insight into what the um, what the applicant might need to be successful in our group to help tailor their orientation and development if they joined. Have you ever had to make a personal or professional change that was challenging for you? Please give us an example and tell us how you handled this situation. People who embrace change are going to be more effective in our system. People who complain and resist change are going to struggle more. Medicine's constantly changing and the pace of change is accelerating. AI is changing much of the world and I expect it will have profound effects on primary care and medicine. People will need to adapt and there's a lot of, and yet there's a lot of resistance to change. Some of it is fear, especially fear that life will be harder. Um, please tell us about your short and long-term goals. Describe your ideal practice of medicine and career. These questions were our final questions. They gave us more of a picture of how this candidate would fit into our group and if there were things we could do to accommodate their needs. Basically, we encouraged all physicians to develop an area of expertise that would expand their knowledge, help teach the rest of the group, and engage them in our work. We felt that some variation from seeing patients nonstop was healthy and that the engagement helped prevent burnout. To that end, we had uh, a variety of, um, of different administrative and leadership positions, um, chief of service, chief of quality, hypertension lead, diabetes lead, cholesterol lead, weight management, osteoporosis, fall prevention, technology lead, new physician development lead, module leaders, as well as wellness champions that doctors could focus and help develop expertise. Additional steps. Um, usually our leadership team would do a group interview uh, with the applicants from nine to 10. Uh, subsequently, we would schedule four 30 minute sessions with other doctors in our clinic um, with a range of doctors, new and more tenured doctors. Um, we wanted to try and give our uh, candidates a feel for the culture of our group. Uh, through meeting multiple people. We wanted them to fit into, uh, feel like they fit into our group um, and to understand what they were signing up for. After that, we spent some social time with doctors, taking them out to lunch um, for about an hour, hour and a half um, to, again, to help everybody get a feel for whether they're um, going to fit, uh, be a good fit. Um, I, I had all the interviewers give me feedback on the candidates before lunch. They were expected to send me a phone message or an email. Um, and then um, after lunch, I would meet with each candidate. If they had the unanimous, unanimous approval of our group, I would uh, often make them a verbal offer. Um, at other times, we might have additional candidates that we wanted to consider. In general, we needed to interview four to five candidates to find one that would join. Um, and in this wrap up meeting, I I would emphasize that our priorities, especially looking to hire people to the best of their knowledge that they would want to stay with our group for the long term. Um, uh, we, we felt like we were making an, a big investment in new physicians. Um, salaries and benefits had little room for negotiation. 
um, if somebody had some experience, they could get a slightly higher salary. They were determined by our board of directors. Um, also, um, one thing that did help was, was that we had um, a forgivable loan program, which if doctors stayed for seven years, um, they they would have their hundred thousand dollar loan forgiven, um, and if they didn't, they would have to pay uh, pay back the loan and pay back uh, the back interest uh, as well. Uh, concerns and follow up. Um, some candidates might be on the fence about an offer and I, I would call them and try and talk to them and understand their situation. Um, again, I, I, I wanted to sell our department, but I, I didn't want to oversell it. I, I wanted people that fit in um, and we're going to fit in for the long term. Um, and then uh, after our offer, applicants needed to go through final approval processes uh, with credentialing and background checks. Um, um, candidates who don't respond timely, that's kind of a red flag. Uh, that they may be considering other offers or not completely sold on the position. Um, so in summary, our goals were to find excellent candidates who could work in our department uh, for, for their full careers. Um, compared with other departments within our Kaiser, we saw less turnover in our medical staff I think largely from um, trying to find the right people to hire. Um, and I believe that setting up this a, a good selection process uh, using these behavioral-based interviewing techniques will allow you to find candidates that are the best fit for your, for your group. Um, and then just a, a comment on our hiring process. Um, towards the end of my career, we had a joint program with uh, our psychiatry department hiring behavioral medicine specialists, clinical psychologists, and um, we used our, our same hiring program and our psychiatry team was very impressed with our process and they adopted it as well for their future interviews. Um, Uh, lastly, uh, my last slide, um, I would say your hiring process is a critical first step in finding candidates that fit into your culture and intend to make a career with your group. Uh, many of you have mentioned onboarding challenges and the need to balance the development of your new hires and the ongoing demands from your patients and administrators. I believe it would be useful to share best practices around onboarding and physician and staff development. And that may be a next step for you guys. And lastly, I wanna just say uh, a big thank you uh, for your roles in caring for our most needy populations and your dedication and commitment. And that's all I have to say and I will take any questions that people have. Don't see any yet, but we'll stay on for a little while longer. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Heller. It's really good.
I'm still sitting on. Okay, we'll give it another minute or so, and then we'll end the webinar. If you have any questions, now is the time. Here's one um, about how long should an interview process last? Um, our interviews, um, we we took the morning, we took half a day for our uh, our interviews. Um, yeah, I, I think you're trying to get a lot of information in a relatively short amount of time. And they're asking from screening to offer, question mark? Um, you know, that that varied a lot um, uh, depending on uh, our, our open positions, um, the candidates that came in. Um, sometimes we knew uh, somebody might be retiring you know, in the middle of the year, usually, usually the middle of the year when residencies finish, um, often people will take the boards and then want to start in the early fall, late September, early October uh, was the most typical time that we hired people. Um, if we had somebody retiring and we knew we were hiring, we might be able to screen people in the prior fall and be able to hire them by by the winter. Um, but it varied, um, you know, it varied with our needs, with our growth, and with the available candidates. Um, sometimes there were people looking to relocate and they might be available uh, at different times of the year as well. And said thanks. <laughs> so we'll stay on a couple more minutes if anyone has any other questions. Okay, well, that looks to be it, Dr. Hatler. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing this for us. It was great. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Okay, have go, a great go day. Eagles. Yes, go birds. <laughs> okay, see you Bye. later. Bye.